not really seeing the screen. I'm seeing a different. Ah, uh, yes, I see that. Yes. Can I see that? Anne Louise, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it too loud? Should I turn down the mic? Okay. I can't hear you guys that well, though. Oh, is that right? On and well, on. Tim, I can hear, I can hear Tim great. I can't hear the folks who are in the room. Uh, yeah, I don't know that the folks who are in the room are on yet. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Aiden. We haven't actually started the session just yet. Thanks. Okay. okay. Should we be quiet now? <laughs> you're, you're welcome to speak. I just wanted to let you know that's why there was the radio silence. Okay. Thanks, Aiden. Aiden. Uh, this is Ron speaking. Good afternoon. I'm hopeful that you can get the uh, camera pointed at something other than underneath the desk it looks like now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. I'll I'll look into that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Commercial Users Constituency Workshop about uh, content regulation and private ordering at Internet Governance Institutions. Uh, Non-Commercial User Constituency is a constituency of uh, ICANN, Internet uh, Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Uh, we have seen uh, in the internet field that there are many uh, private actors and pr platforms that get engaged with uh, content regulation and takedown of uh, content. Uh, we want to avoid that uh, at uh, internet governance institutions and in this uh, session we are going to focus specifically on ICANN and how uh, it's uh, might get involved with content regulation and why it should not get involved with content regulation and uh, how that affects uh, freedom of speech. So uh, on this uh, panel, uh, we have uh, Becky Bear from ICANN Board who can make real decisions. And uh, we, have, uh, we ha also have Brian Cute uh, from uh, .org registry. 
and uh, he's going to uh, talk to us about uh, the uh, contractual relation of uh, the, uh, .org and ICANN, how that affects their decision on uh, content takedown and their general decision on content takedown at .org. And uh, we have Tatiana Tarpina. Tatiana is a, a non-commercial stakeholder group counselor, and uh, also uh, she's a, a cyber uh, security and cyber, cyber crime uh, researcher at Max Planck Institute. She is uh, going to tell us more about how uh, DN domain name uh, system abuse uh, attempts at ICANN can sometimes lead us to content regulation. And my name is Farzan Abadi. <laughs> I forgot. And I am the chair of non-commercial stakeholder group. I used to be the chair of non-commercial users constituency. And uh, well, we have Milton uh, Muller, co-founder of uh, NCUC. And uh, we also have two remote uh, uh, panelists. Uh, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie has uh, recently written a very uh, intriguing paper about uh, how ICANN actually gets involved with um, uh, content uh, regulation. And uh, we also have Timmy Smith from the Canadian uh, Pharmacy Association who will talk about uh, how uh, policies of ICANN can, uh, uh, can affect content regulation and domain name takedown. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go to Anne-Marie. Amory is going to talk, uh, is going to be online. So, uh, if you could put the headset on your ears, so that you can hear her. And uh, Amory, if you could start your presentation, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. So, I just wanted to take a few minutes to sort of overview the, the article that I wrote. Um, so, everybody knows that I can involved almost from its inception with resolving disputes over trademarks in domain names. Uh, that's the UDRT. Uh, but ICANN has never been involved in adjudicating disputes over copyrights or any other kind of content on websites. And its public messaging on that point, I think, has always been very clear. That line in the sand shifted, though, in 2013, when ICANN adopted contracts with DNS intermediaries for new GTLDs that build a legal scaffold for privately ordered copyright and trademark notice and takedown within the DNS. So that contractual scaffolding is located in the section of the new ICANN registry agreement called Specification 11, uh, Public Interest Commitments, or PIC. Uh, Specification 11 requires every new GTLD registry operator to pass along to registrars, a contractual provision that requires registrars to pass along to registrants, a contractual provision prohibiting piracy and counterfeiting and providing consequences for breach, including suspension of domain names. So copyright and trademark holders have taken the position with ICANN that registrars have to not only include this pass along provision in their contracts with registrants, but they also have to enforce it by suspending domain names in response to notices or reports of abuse from right holders. They argue that registrars that fail to do so are out of compliance with their contractual commitments to ICANN. So far, ICANN has defended registrars who insist on getting court orders before they suspend domain names for alleged pirate sites. Um, but ICANN contractual compliance staff are under significant and continuous pressure from right holders on this point, and I guess the folks uh, in the room who are from ICANN can speak to that uh, better than I can. Uh, the other important development I want to highlight with respect to the migration of content regulation into the DNS is the 2016 trusted notifier arrangement between Donuts and the Motion Picture Association of America. Uh, that program allows Donuts, which is the registry operator for hundreds of new GTLDs, including .ruby, to bypass reluctant registrars and suspend domain names at the registry level if a registrar refuses to take action in response to an MPAA complaint. So Donuts basically decides in its discretion, without benefit of any public legal process, which domain name should be suspended uh, or canceled. So together, I think PICS and the Trusted Notifier Program represent an unprecedented expansion into content regulation at the Internet's application layer by DNS intermediaries. 
Uh, and for those of us who believe that ICANN and its intermediaries should limit their remit to the IANA functions, I think these are troubling developments. So that's basically my, my summary uh, of the article. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Amory. And uh, so, uh, Milton, considering uh, what Anne-Marie just said, uh, how, does, how can this affect freedom of expression? Okay. So, the, um, I, Anne Marie has done us a, a great service by, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, by analyzing carefully the relationship between uh, ICANN's new RIA uh, Registrar Accreditation Agreement and, and particularly Spec 11. Um, we do know that uh, at that period of time, 2013, uh, ICANN was under enormous pressure, not only from copyright holders, but from uh, law enforcement agencies who wanted to effectively uh, make the domain names who are internet intermediaries, uh, domain name registrars, uh, take on more and more of the responsibility of enforcement. <clears throat> and indeed, this was a big push uh, by the intellectual property interests uh, as well as law enforcement to uh, push more and more responsibility onto intermediaries. We see the same thing uh, happening now with the big platforms, Facebook and so on, and, and uh, Twitter, in which uh, people who want to control or censor uh, certain forms of speech are expecting the intermediary to do it for them. Even though, in the U.S. at least, we have this pure principle of uh, immunity for intermediaries uh, regarding the content posted by their users. Uh, now, generally, uh, free speech advocates have uh, very strongly supported this principle of intermediary immunity because we don't want the uh, intermediary to be acting as a gatekeeper uh, who will be um, essentially filtering what comes onto their platform uh, in an extra legal way. That is, uh, they, they simply are afraid that they might get into trouble, so they'll minimize their costs by uh, blocking or preventing things from being posted that might get them into trouble regardless of whether they're illegal. So the implications of freedom, for freedom of speech are not good if we extend this principle uh, into uh, the domain name system. Now, since 2013, I think there's been a lot of pushback in the ICANN environment. Uh, ICANN has a new mission statement which specifically prohibits it from getting involved in content regulation. Uh, unfortunately, some of the earlier arrangements were grandfathered uh, so that, for example, certain kinds of contractual commitments that registries made uh, prior to uh, the, the new bylaws being passed in 2016 uh, will still be in effect, but going forward, no, uh, no more of these agreements are supposed to be possible. Um, I think uh, in, in all of the discussions of intermediary responsibility and immunity, a uh, domain name system tends to be overlooked, um, but it is one of the real bottlenecks or choke points at which people will and do try to assert control. And uh, w one of the purposes of this panel, I think, is to bring, uh, raise awareness among people uh, about the importance of the domain name system and ICANN regulation uh, in this area of overlapping into content regulation. Thank you. Uh, so, Becky, as, uh, do you think that we are at risk of ICANN, uh, uh, we are at risk of content regulation at ICANN? Uh, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I, wear, I wear several hats here, and I just want to start by putting those on the table. I am a member of the ICANN board. I also was the lawyer who negotiated the Registrar Accreditation Agreement in 2013 on behalf of the registrars. 
um, and uh, I am, am employed by New Star, which is a registry. So just to, so everybody understands the perspective that I'm coming from. Um, the fourth thing is that I was actually at the table when the very first um, registrar accreditation agreement and registry agreement was negotiated between VeriSign and um, ICANN. And uh, the words uh, in specification one with respect to um, reg not the prohibition on regulation of content uh, is very important. And I think as Anne-Marie said, um, ICANN has refrained from uh, regulating content, from uh, doing any of those things. Um, I understand the concern about um, uh, the trusted notifier system in the following way. Um, I think that uh, at one point, um, Fadi took a little credit for the trusted notifier decision, and I tend to think that may have been taking credit as opposed to um, an actual, uh, uh, an actual, I certainly as a registry never felt any pressure um, to uh, use one of those systems. Um, I, I have views on those systems that, that we can talk about, but, um, and of course, uh, the, the mission statement is very, very clear. Now, um, with respect to PICS, with, with respect to the provision in the contract that says you will require registrars to flow down, to include a prohibition, um, I think that ICANN's track record on um, enforcement of that uh, provision is, um, is very uh, clear. Um, Obviously, if the, the provisions were not flown down, that would be a violation, um, but they have not stepped in uh, to uh, intervene with respect to whether or not the, the um, provision is being an enforced. Um, and with respect to the PICs, if you look at the standard PICs, um, uh, I think that the only standard PIC um, that uh, by, that you know could potentially be argued to uh, violate the bylaws um, is not about content at all. It's a, it's the the one that prohibits um, closed generics, which is because that just wasn't a part that wasn't a piece of policy that was developed by the community. But the other uh, standard picks. Um, are pretty straightforward and, and um, I think quite reasonable and don't touch content. So I don't think those create a, an issue. Um, there were some uh, folks who put a lot of uh, promises into um, the, the voluntary picks. Uh, I agree that some of those are um, problematic. On the other hand, um, you know, they put those in on a voluntary basis, and they were actually quite voluntary because there were a lot of registries in the room who said, no, we're gonna have a st set of standard public interest commitments, we're gonna negotiate them, we're gonna understand how they're gonna be enforced. This way is a disaster. Um, but some, some registries did put those in and they made commitments that uh, about things that frankly um, are uh, outside of ICANN's mission statement. Um, I don't believe that ICANN has been called upon uh, to get in the middle of those yet. Um, and I uh, think that um, however ICANN uh, does it, uh, they, uh, the, I, it, ICANN will be careful um, and extremely mindful of the pro prohibition on content uh, regulation. There's a little, there's a kind of funny thing though that it just, to be clear, people threw those picks in um, because they wanted to get a contract and they thought they were gonna get a, a benefit from it. Um, and they you know, got in line uh, uh, to do that. And so from a, from a contractual uh, point of view, completely outside of the content regulation, um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a disconnect and a bit of uh, discomfort about um, why people should have uh, been able to make commitments to get in line in, you know, in front of other people and then not have to live up to them.
So that's not about content regulation, it's just about sort of equity. So my view is that ICANN is uh, extremely clear about the content prohibition. There are some situations in which uh, remaining faithful to that prohibition could be difficult, but I see no um, interest uh, in, uh, on ICANN's part in wading in on that. Thank you very much, uh, Becky. So there are some concerns. It's not like that we are <laughs> here for nothing. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Tim, if Tim is another remote panelist, if he could make his intervention. So is he around? Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, actually, I wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about trusted notifiers uh, from, uh, from our standpoint, uh, from the Canadian International Pharmacy Association standpoint. Uh, and uh, um, as Emily's already spoken about um, uh, the uh, agreements between MPAA and Donuts. Uh, you know, we are uh, watching the um, healthy domains initiative of the Domain Name Association. Uh, and we've seen trusted notifiers show up there. Um, so it seems to be something that is moving forward. Uh, and of course, the area where we uh, observe it most closely is, um, and where our attention is, is in the complaints handling for rogue online pharmacies, which is one of the healthy practices of the healthy domain initiative. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, they define that as a party that is capable of providing relevant uh, and complete evidence uh, needed to take action against a registrant. And um, uh, I guess, you know, SIPA in, in generally doesn't have too many concerns with uh, voluntary initiatives or uh, some private ordering. Uh, we do have concerns if that is too heavy handed uh, and, um, and depending on whether uh, um, people try their commercial interest become the trusted notifier. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that's an issue that, that we have uh, with uh, with the healthy practices uh, as they are stated. Uh, now we are a member, uh, an associate member of the DNA.org, the domain domain name association. So hopefully that we can have some um, some um, participation uh, in the rollout of healthy practices. Um, but uh, and, and I guess just to state a little bit about who we are. We are licensed pharmacies um, that hold licenses where we operate and we dispense medications that are um, approved by the health authority where we live and we, uh, and we comply with all regulations where we operate. Um, and as a matter of fact, I guess we are our own self-regulatory body and I, we do our own private ordering. Uh, because not anybody can become a member of our association. Not any online pharmacy meets uh, our standards of legitimacy. So that's a um, trusted notifier moving forward, uh, if not properly managed, I think can be a concern for legitimate operators uh, on the online uh, on the net. Uh, I think as it relates to ICANN too, I, I, one of the concerns that we have is is um, the way in which doc pharmacy was granted uh, and um, and when I say that um, the doc pharmacy registry was granted to a US based trade association uh, to manage a global resource uh, and while we see uh, something like a doc pharmacy um, having potential to becoming a trusted um, destination for internet users seeking um, legitimate uh, online pharmacy services, uh, what we see in their registration criteria is um, what has become sort of a, um, a, a domestic marketplace, an old traditional marketplace um, um, with, uh, with national borders around it, uh, rather than being reflected of the way that people use the internet today, which is to cross borders to find medications that they either don't trust where they live or can't afford where they live. Uh, and uh, the dot pharmacy uh, criteria doesn't reflect the realities 
with millions of, of uh, people who have uh, benefited from being able to obtain medication from legitimate pharmacies wherever they're located in the world. So, um, so I think I, I see that as being content regulation as well by restricting um, what could be a trusted domain name uh, to a small group uh, with very restricted um, criteria. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so now we go to Brian. Um, Brian, can you tell us a bit how uh, the contractual relation between PIR and ICANN affect uh, your uh, governance and content takedown? Thanks. Sure. And also, if you could add a bit on your strategy of taking down content. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Farzi. Can, can everyone hear me clearly? Thank you. Uh, so to start at the beginning, public interest registry doesn't believe that registry operators should be arbiters of content on the internet. That's a principle and belief. Um, and when we address the question of do we take down a .org, uh, we tend to focus on two principles, that is due process on the one hand and rule of law on the other. And in fact, we do have a takedown policy in practice uh, that we've, uh, is very robust and that we followed over the years with those two principles at the heart of it. What we articulate with an R abuse and takedown policy is what we call technical abuse of the DNS. That's an important distinction. It keeps us away from content where we don't think we should go. Phishing, malware, botnets, that sort of thing. So that's how we approach this question of takedowns and the line of content and what we try to manage rightfully as a registry operator contracted with ICANN. Um, and with every rule, there is always an exception. Uh, so the one content exception I can speak to is child pornography. Uh, we do take that down. We have a process for that. It's illegal, it's unethical, and we think that's an appropriate exception to don't touch content. <coughs> a question of content that's raised recently with some events in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the Daily Stormer site, if you're aware of that, was around hate speech. And hate speech, as repugnant as that is, is protected speech. We wouldn't just take that down. However, exception, under US law, and we reside in the US legally, if there's a clear and specific call to violence within hate speech, we take that down. It's illegal. So there's lines. There's very careful exceptions. And that's how we try to manage the line between content and DNS technical abuse at Public Interest Registry. What we see is the bigger concern than the concerns that are on the table about ICANN and contracted parties, which are fair to discuss, is the environment we're all in now as registry operators, as internet service providers, as registrars. There is increasing government pressure from many points for registries, for registrars, for other service providers to take down content, and that pressure is increasing. On the other hand, you see operators putting forward a trusted notifier model. That's their right. Um, that's their prerogative. And we see a trusted notifier model as, as a way to, to, to manage their zone, but we look at the model that's out there and say, you know, we don't think that that addresses due process and rule of law as fully as we think those principles should be addressed. So as operators in that environment of increasing government pressure to get into content and other service providers offering models, we think it's incumbent on us at PIR to be thoughtful, to think deeply about what are the right approaches to this very thorny question. You have the example of the Cloudflare CEO who wakes up one morning and says, I don't think that site should be on my platform. That's not the approach. This is, a, this is a challenge for all of us. This is the environment we're living in. And so there should be some thought and some process to that. Um, we, in the last year, we had been socializing, discussing a potential policy to address systemic copyright abuse. And in that frame, we were considering 
an abuse, a type of abuse, which is illegal on its face, which is narrow, where the clear purpose of a site is to perpetrate systemic copyright violation. Are, are you ready? We were discussing that within ICANN. We were discussing that in other fora with stakeholders. We received a lot of important feedback and clear feedback from stakeholders. And last year, we decided to pull back from that effort and reflect. And what we're reflecting on right now, in addition to the challenging environment that we all have to address one way or the other, is as a service provider, as a registry, but also as a service provider, registrar, ISP, if you're going to be adopting important policies of this nature, what process do you use? The policy we were considering was not a policy that had to go through the ICANN process at all, by definition, under our contract, not with an ICANN. So if that's the case, and we're providing a global service, what should the proper process be for engaging stakeholders, for getting inputs, for defining what the policy could be and the impacts and making a thoughtful decision at the end of the day. Because we believe we can't sit back on the sidelines while this government pressure increases, bad regulation comes down, and other service providers start offering models that are, I woke up this morning and I don't think this content should be on my platform. It's their prerogative. Consumers can vote with their feet. That's still a choice, but we don't think that's the right model. We don't think that's the right approach. And we think that we need to be talking about what the right process to these questions is. Thank you uh, very much, Brian. I'm going to leave the questions for later after Tatiana's uh, intervention. Um, actually, can I ask Brian something before my intervention? I okay. I, I would love to. Uh, no, it's just okay. Um, so, what is your question to me then? So it's about how, how does DNS app use effort at ICANN can affect uh, content regulation? Uh, thank you very much. So yes, I think that despite the fact that it is clearly outlined in the ICANN mission that ICANN is not going to get involved in the content regulation, I believe that some of the initiatives that are going on in ICANN organization and ICANN community are actually kind of... Um, providing some driving force to the debates which bring us back to the content regulations issue. And um, one of them is DNS abuse. And starting from like what kind, kind of DNS abuse should be reported to ICANN and analyzed by ICANN. And secondly, what kind of actions ICANN registries and registrars should take in relation to this DNS abuse, which is not properly defined. Like, for example, at the recent ICANN meeting, the community, cross-community session discussed the DNS abuse reporting. And even during preparation for that session, it was so clear that the views of the community are not matching at all, because there are some voices that we should add, for example, child abuse images to the abuse that has to be reported by, uh, to ICANN, despite ICANN's limited mission. Um, those who advocate for copyright, systemic or non-systemic copyright abuse to be reported to ICANN, make some argument that, for example, pi pirated material downloads and so on can contain some links to malware, and this, you know, in, in turn raises the technical abuse. So to me, it doesn't sound like an argument I would buy personally, but there is a lot of option to sell this argument also because RAA from 2013 <clears throat> does not define illegal in a narrow technical sense. And so we do struggle with ICANN, first of all, with this notion of DNS abuse, which ICANN always says uh, has to be related only to its narrow technical mission, but many, some, some of the parts of the community, which represented by many community members, are not um, agreeing with this. Secondly, is this notion of preventive approach and how ICANN registries and registrars should react to the abuse reported? Should they take actions or not? And should I can coordinate these actions? And while it is 
clear for many community members that DNS abuse can actually be beneficial. Uh, reporting of DN, DN, uh, sorry, reporting of DNS abuse can actually be beneficial. While you can analyze these data and see the risks and so on, um, between collecting the data about DNS abuse and taking actual actions. Um, um, upon the reports, there are some steps like due process, which almost never considered during these debates. Like we think that DNS abuse is happening and we have to react, but what is in between? How? What is the trusted source to report about DNS abuse? How many reports should be there? Should uh, registries or registrars or contact the abusers and so on. These steps are almost never discussed or just ignored because we are moving um, immediately from the fact that abuse is happening to the fact that, to, to, to the notion that we have somehow to be preventive or react to this. So I believe that what is needed here is the clear and narrow definition of DNS abuse, technical definition related to ICANN mission. And while I hear a lot of about ICANN not dealing with content regulation um, becoming a common wisdom and this notion supported by the board, I, I really see that DNS abuse is a kind of way to, you know, circumvent this, depending on what abuse can be reported and what actions could be taken upon this. And what I also think is missing here is that um, I don't think ICANN or registries or registrars is the right, right point to tackle DNS abuse. Technical abuse probably maybe, but in these discussions what we, what we forget frequently is that it is a domain of law enforcement. And I don't believe that content takedown or website takedown or domain name takedown will actually help to catch the criminal. Probably not. Michele, I see your face. I think that you can intervene after and argue with me if you don't believe in, 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 in the fact that it's, it's, it's the domain of law enforcement, you know, to cage the criminals. But I strongly believe in this. I do believe that it's not only we who need the due process. It's also, you know, the function of criminal law and criminal procedural law, and we should not, you know, kind of replace it with the private judgments with no borders. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, are there any comments or questions? Michaela, do you want to say something? Uh, thanks. Uh, Michaela Nalen, dirty, filthy registrar and hosting provider who totally disagrees with Tatiana. Um, you know, this, this concept of due process and everything else is laudable, and I have no issue with the concept, but the reality of it is, as a hosting provider, I have a duty of care to all of my clients. And that means that my clients need to be able to, to use our services. If they pay us for hosting, if they pay us to be able to send emails, they need for those emails to actually be able to go to, their to the destinations. So what that means in real terms is that if we find people abusing our hosting platform, we are going to shut them down. I am not going to start getting into it, questions of due process when somebody signs up for a hosting account with us using a stolen credit card, probably a stolen identity, and within 25 minutes of signing up has started sending out huge quantities of spam, of phishing, phishing th mails, and many other kinds of charming things. Now, if you want me to have due process for that kind of thing, I mean, I'm afraid there's nothing for us to, d to discuss because it's just not going to happen. Uh, Michele, I think that we are talking a bit of a different thing here and now. I was mostly talking about judgment about content. Having due process in your <clears throat> company and taking down whatever you want, you can do even with regard to content. I don't care. Uh, you know, if you don't want anyone to put the pictures of tomatoes and host them on the website, which is on your platform or registered or whatever, I don't care what, what kind of rules you will establish and what kind of due process you will have. But I do care when all of you come together at ICANN and decide that ICANN might establish the rules for this. This is where 
where my hard stop is. What you do uh, in your own personal platform or, or, or registries or registrars, it's, it's, it's your private domain. Do what you want. I mean, law gives you this opportunity. Um, so I want to just go a little bit further than Tatiana and I'd say I would still care what you do on your private hosting platform in terms of due process. We have a set of principles called the Manila Principles on Intermediary Liability which suggests that yes, of course, you can decide you don't want to host pictures of tomatoes on your platform, but if you do, then you have to be transparent about that, you have to have a process so that if someone actually has a zucchini and you take that down, they can have a process of appeal saying, hey, that wasn't a tomato, that was a zucchini. Um, so so um, obviously in cases where the content is seriously illegal then, then that can be adapted but in general we do think that regardless um, of whether it's your private platform you should still have, um, even though you're legally entitled to do what you want, and Tatiana is absolutely correct about that, um, there should still be a process so that, um, that people have predictability and accountability in terms of what happens to the content that you're hosting for them. And the second point that I want to make actually is a question to Brian. Um, do you think, so as you may know, I was one of the, well, as you do know, <laughs> I was one of the, the people who <laughs> um, r uh, raised concerns about the, um, uh, um, the copyright um, policy that you were considering. And um, I was wondering whether you would do it differently this way if you were considering putting up a policy, whether it's on content, uh, sorry, sorry, whether it's on copyright or pharmaceuticals or something else, if you were considering developing a new content policy, would you do it in the same way or do you think there were some mistakes that were made and that you might do it differently next time in terms of the process? Uh, thanks for the question, Jeremy. And I think we would do it differently. And I, th I think there were some mistakes that were made. And from my perspective in this, in this, uh, lens, at least, um, the engagement, you know, I mean, we, we understood that we were considering a new abuse policy that didn't fit within ICANN's processes. We didn't have to run it through a PDP process. It's not, we don't have that obligation. It didn't involve ICANN. So we went about attempting to engage stakeholders, both at meetings inside ICANN and inside ICANN and outside of ICANN of a period of about 18 months. Um, but we look back at that and said that that just wasn't the best approach. And so to answer your question, yeah, I think we would do that differently. That's why I teed up that question. What process should a service provider use or engage in to make sure that if, and again, this is an individual choice. Other service providers can do it differently. But how would we engage so that stakeholder input is heard and understood, that a rational outcome is there, that the right, the right approach is what the outcome is? Uh, but Brian, some uh, also the non-commercial users constituency was um, issued a statement and asked uh, not to go ahead with that uh, systematic copyright uh, alternative dispute resolutions. So um, some stakeholder groups are in opposition to this uh, policy and uh, we frankly don't think you should uh, get involved or even come up with the idea that another third party uh, should get involved with dispute resolution about uh, copyright. When you uh, see such uh, opposition, why? Um, I understand that you argue that, but there is a lot of government uh, pressure to go ahead with these um, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, does, does that mean that even after the stakeholder groups and those who are interested uh, would tell you that we don't want an alternative dispute resolution for copyright, would that or go ahead and uh, adopt a policy? Well, to answer your question, we're thinking about that. Again, we're, we've pulled back from it and we're reflecting on what the right way forward would be for engagement. And with respect to any policy, whether it was systemic copyright or any other policy, you know, for us, when we say, when you say third party, we think neutral third party with due process embedded at every step of the process and a neutral third party that has the expertise and acumen to make a decision and is not invested in the outcome. You know, we see a distinction between some of the models that are beginning to surface where you have a decision maker who has a vested interest in the outcome. 
So from a principal's perspective, that's what we're thinking through. And, and whether it would be that policy or some other policy, the important point is that due process and rule of law are at the center of it for our approach. And we want to make sure that an engagement with stakeholders is appropriately done. Uh, Becky, do. So I'm going to put on a hat that is entirely different than any of the ones that I disclosed, and, and um, Larry's laughing at me. Uh, when I was in private practice, I had a company, a client, who was a company that was a financial institution. It was actually a B2B financial institution. Um, they had their enti the entire content of their web page copied and, and posted with a domain name that was similar but not uh, the same, um, you know, so-and-so financial dot uh, co dot UK is what it was uh, signed up. And it uh, had set up the functionality of the website pretty cl cleverly, so it texted uh, hundreds of thousands of UK consumers with a message that said, your loan documents are ready, please go to da 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 da, da uh, to sign up for your loan document. Now, we can all question the wisdom of people who responded, but I can tell you that a lot of consumers, in fact, uh, did respond to that. And um, m my uh, client asked me to figure out how to stop that. Um, and so I, uh, you know, of course, we called the hosting company. The hosting companies took it down, but it reappeared the next day. We called um, uh, registrars. The registrars uh, took it down, but it reappeared uh, the next day. Um, we uh, called uh, registries, and finally, after a week, it took a week to do this, um, consumers were being affirmatively harmed. Um, it wasn't, uh, uh, and, but, but the thing that was incredible to me about it was um, I spoke to, um, uh, uh, I spoke to the heads of the different registries and registrars that I spoke to. I used my uh, personal relationships with them to uh, get this dealt with. Um, there was essentially uh, no system and the, for dealing with this kind of things within the registries and registrars that I was talking to at that time, and it was some time ago. Um, and, uh, and I sort of felt like, well, if it took me a week to solve this problem, what would it take uh, you know, somebody who's not familiar with it? Um, so in my, uh, wearing my hat as a registry operator, like McKaylee, I will take stuff down. Um, and I do think that uh, we have an obligation to um, protect uh, all of our customers and, the, and, and users out there. So um, the, the, I, I just think it's a more complicated um, issue than, than one might think because there's lots of different kinds of content. So I just wanted to say, uh, I'm with Michaela. If, if, if something is uh, is um, harming uh, uh, consumers, I'm going to take it down. If it was completely obvious to me that it was entirely stolen, um, I would probably take it down too. Excuse me, can I quickly ask a question? Becky, when you're wearing this hat, uh, not the icon board hat, um, Regarding takedowns, yes, you will take down, but um, would you like ICANN to tell you what to take down? No, I would not like ICANN to, take, uh, to tell me what to take down. And if McKaylee or anybody else was to come to ICANN um, and ask for a system that did that, I would resist it entirely. And I think that the private ordering issue is what's really at stake here. Um, Registries and registrars are commercial actors who have the ability uh, to address um, uh, issues that they see, abuses that they see on their platforms. I can should not be involved in that when it's content, but um, I, I don't think. Uh, uh, and, and as wearing my board hat, if anybody was to come and ask for that, I think. I would certainly say no, and I think all of the board members that I work with would say no, and I think ICANN organization would say no. So 
<clears throat> now I think we're really getting to the nub of the issue. Um, yes, in the real world of the Internet, uh, operational concerns uh, dictate uh, rapid action many times. And the way the ICANN regime approaches this is to give private actors uh, a, a lot of flexibility to act on a contractual basis uh, with their customers. Uh, and hopefully there's enough competition uh, among actors to prevent them from abusing uh, this power. Uh, and if they, you know, they take things down randomly or arbitrarily or in a, in a re really objectionable manner, then the customers go elsewhere. Uh, so I think we could probably agree on that. There may be some people who think, uh, probably Europeans who think that that should be statute rather than contractual. But um, I think the problem comes uh, when the government uh, steps in and puts pressure on the private intermediary that is ex external to the market, uh, has nothing to do with consumer demand or supply. And um, I guess my first question is to Brian, is sort of like, you, you mentioned this pressure. What form does this take? Are they threatening you? Are you visited by, like, black helicopters and, and uh, taken away to uh, Guantanamo Bay and sort of <laughs> prodded with uh, things? Or are they sort of <laughs> coming into your office and saying, uh, it's a really nice business you have here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Um, <laughs> How did anyway, you know? How did I'm you just, know, Milton? Right now, I'm just wearing my, my, I have a Christmas hat that has like a snowman with a carrot on his nose, and that's, that's the hat I'm wearing. Now, you know, Thank you very so. much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Milton. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've all seen some instances. And yes, we do get approached. Um, we are very rigorous about requiring court orders, requiring subpoenas. We have a very clear and rigorous legal process for takedowns. We publish what we do on our website in terms of those types of takedowns. And since we're sitting in the UN and a little bit of diplomacy is warranted, um, there are certain governments who we have all observed have asked service providers to take content down uh, within their jurisdiction. Uh, there are some approaches and laws in different jurisdictions that are putting pressure on us um, without naming names. Uh, but yes, this is something that we... You don't have to name names, but can you tell me seriously more about the, the way they exert pressure? I'm really interested in that. It's usually a request for assistance. And typically there is um, something criminal or illegal or think about, you know, a, a botnet attack, right? I mean, that's a very good example of something that's healthy that we do that addresses technical abuse of the DNS, working with law enforcement when there's a clear botnet that's about to be launched. That's, that's on the, the, the technical abuse policy practice for us that we think is, is appropriate, absolutely. Um, and sometimes there are requests for assistance, and our practice has always been court order, subpoena, get us the necessary papers under the law that are required, and we're happy to work with the government, of course. When <clears throat> we receive uh, requests for takedowns from outside of the U.S., which is our home jurisdiction, we insist that those orders or papers be domesticated in a U.S. court in Virginia, where we reside. So again, we rely very heavily on process, on due process, on rule of law in terms of what we do. But the, the pressure is real, even if there aren't any black helicopters. Uh, Edmund Chung here. Well, I guess building on uh, and and personally and from from Dot Asia, we, we're quite supportive of the position that that you know I can should stay away from this and, and registries as much as possible to stay away from it. However, uh, building on what 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 Brian was saying, um, there there are some realities in, in terms of uh, like child abuse material. There are some realities about. Uh, 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 the the hate speech uh, stuff that is coming down the, the pipe that that the, the question I want to bring out is whether um, there there was a big pushback that the, the, the nothing of this sort uh, uh, 
should be at I discussed at ICANN or, or formulated into some kind of a policy or guidelines in, in ICANN. But what about the reverse, the types of due diligence that need to be done by registries and registrars to actually take those down? Doesn't that, you know, I, I, I sometimes think about whether that might be a good idea to, to lay out actually the, you know, the types of due diligence that, that should be in place. And here's a, an example recent, you know, recently that, that has been a growing situation that I think it would uh, warrant some interesting thoughts um, and sharing it. Hopefully it makes sense to everyone. Uh, and, and it's about phishing and it's about brands at the same time. Here's what's happening in, in, in the wild today. Uh, these systems are automatically picking up domain names and seeing, you know, if it contains a brand name, the brand takes a look at it and they, they file something uh, to, to the registrars and increasingly they are tagging them as phishing sites. So what happens is that once they're tagged phishing sites, then registrars take notice and they, they, they do something. Uh, and recently, there, there has been a couple cases that uh, on the third level domain, a brand, imagine brand dot, uh, and it is a financial institution, uh, brand dot uh, domain dot TLD, um, because of that, uh, was filed as, 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 a, uh, as a phishing report uh, into a registrar. Um, the, 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 the domain owner happened to, my, to be my friend, and that's why I kind of came to know about it. Um, they, 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 they noticed the regist registrant um, for a couple times within 24 hours, and then the site was completely take down, taken down. What happened was that, you know, the, 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 the poor person was running a, a, a domain that actually provided services to many uh, clients that they put on the third level domain. Um, and, you know, so th they have, have lots of third level domains that are quote unquote brand names. And this one just happens to be uh, a financial institute and they were setting up a demo site and, you know, they, they, were, they were taken down. Um, it, took me, actually, like, like what Becky was saying, it took me about 12 hours to get the site back up, but it, I can imagine uh, uh, if it wasn't somebody who was in the industry, it's going to take days, and they would have lost a lot of business. Uh, probably the business will have to go somewhere else or change the domain. So that brings me to the question of, you know, since all this thing is coming, and, and just by saying that, you know, we're only taking care of uh, domain abuse in, in the technical sense may not be so clear cut anymore, uh, especially with these, uh, these type of situations. So the question again, back to, is there some reason that, that, that the ICANN community should, should actually address this issue and think about what the, what the uh, takedown process and due diligence, uh, you know, due process should be for registries and registrar to, 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 you know, to actually take action. Because right now, yes, it's, it's kind of good that we each do, do our own thing, but, you know, is there some merit to, to think about a, a more unified approach, uniform approach? I just want to say that uh, what, what you've given us is a classic case of um, the, there should be some kind of liability or responsibility for the person claiming abuse, right? When somebody abuses the process by calling a, a standard kind of overexpansive trademark claim a phishing site and triggering all of these actions, could there be some kind of liability for doing that? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not sure what kind of legal mechanisms would have to be involved, but clearly that's, that's a form of abuse, right? N not, not just that kind of retribution, but, but just the due process that should be in place at the registrar to, quote unquote, fight this type of uh, 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 request. Okay, thank you. Anne-Marie Anne has a comment. She's a remote panelist. Put your headsets on. Yeah, so my question, I guess, is for Brian and has to do with the copyright dispute resolution protocol that uh, the Public Interest Registry pulled back from last spring. And my question has to do with the ease with which copyright holders are going into U.S. courts and getting courts to issue injunctions that are binding on all kinds of DNS intermediaries and search engines and, and lots of different intermediaries. Uh, so they're going into court, they're filing copyright infringement suits, uh, they are getting sort of at the TRO stage and at the preliminary injunction stage pretty rapid relief uh, in the form of injunctions against uh, 
all of these different intermediaries. So I'm thinking of the Sci-Hub case that Elsevier filed and also the Arista Records case against Brood Shark. So these are some of the higher profile cases we've seen in the last couple of years. And so my question is, you guys got pretty far down the road with the CDRT thing before you pulled it back. And I guess this question maybe resonates a little bit with Milton's questions early, question earlier. How did you become convinced that the copyright system is broken, right? I mean, you, you talk about how you guys rely on due process and court orders and you feel like that's the right process. And it seems to me that in U.S. courts and also abroad, right holders are able to go into court and get pretty quick injunctive relief um, that purports to bind registrars and registries and all kinds of other intermediaries. So I'm just wondering, you know, where your sense of the brokenness of that system came from um, that, that, that allowed you to get so far down the road with that really full-blown alternative dispute resolution protocol before you pulled back from it. Thanks for the question. And I'm not sure if I understood the first part of it. It sounded like you were saying there was some problem with the court system and the, and the cases that are being filed, um, which would be important yeah. uh, if that's the case. Um, again, we rely on due process and rule of law. We rely on court orders for takedowns. And if there was something not working in the judicial system appropriately, that would be a concern. Uh, we expect the courts to issue well-reasoned rulings on these matters. Um, with respect to the, the copyright, it's not deciding the system is broken. It was looking at a very narrow instance, potentially, where the clear purpose of a website was to engage in systematic, systematic copyright abuse. It was an, an area that um, is akin to something that's illegal on its face. We think of, a, think of a website that offers nothing but stolen credit cards on its face. Those exist. Becky made a reference to them. We've taken those down because they're, they're illegal on their face. So it wasn't a, a decision that the whole system is broken. We rely on the court system at a return and due process. And where there are opportunities to develop models that embed due process, that address an area thoughtfully, and that respect the rule of law, and where a decision maker doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome, those are the types of models that we think the community should be thinking about. He didn't mean under the auspices of ICANN. Um, so I, I hear a lot about um, respecting and protecting your customers, and uh, I hear that about the damages and harms that can be done to the customers when uh, you don't take down some content, but I do not hear a lot of things about how you actually harm freedom of speech and freedom of expression when you uh, take down content. Are you at all worried about that? Michaela, maybe you can. Thanks for picking on me. It's my own fault, I guess. Um, like freedom of speech, well, first off, freedom of speech is not something that's global. I mean, the, under the US law, under US law, there are, there are heavy protections, but that, those protections don't extend globally. So for us, as we are an Irish company, so we are subject to Irish law. So even myself, I've, been, I've had several cases involving blog posts that I wrote, which were you know, my own opinion, uh, that were then categorized as you know, highly defamatory. And my, my external counsel um, basically advised me, he says, you know, I know you're gonna hate this, but can you please take that down? Because there's no way we're gonna win this in court. And that's, you know, that's, that's one, one aspect of it. I mean, we see cases where uh, rights holders try to su suppress speech by using intellectual property laws to, to shut s stuff down. So, for example, we had an incident involving a, a small community group that was um, protesting against the construction of something. I, I think it might have been a factory or something else, which was going to spew lots of charming gases into the local atmosphere. They used a slightly modified version of the logo of the company that was building the factory, and then that company then tried to get us to shut it down. Now, we didn't, and we wouldn't. And, that's, and when, for those kind of cases, what we will do is very similar to Brian, is 
we're going to politely say, well, one, sort it out between yourself and them. Don't ask us to play arbiter. That's not our role. And secondly, you know, if you want to enforce whatever thing it is that you're trying to enforce, back that up with the actual paperwork in the correct jurisdiction. So, I mean, going back to the thing about, say, the government pressure, um, the recent Catalan uh, referendum, we received multiple requests from the Guardia Civil and other parts of the, of the Spanish government. We would quite happily, or unhappily, um, have complied with them if they'd been domesticated under Irish law. But there is no way that I am going to open up my company to receiving and processing requests from outside Ireland. If I, if I was to do that, then it would never end because we've had the same from other governments, we've had the same from um, law enforcement agencies and other jurisdictions. That doesn't mean we're going to ignore certain types of things, but I mean, we're, we're not interested in playing arbiter of what, you know, what free speech is legal or not legal. But the thing I find kind of disturbing around some of these conversations is that, you know, it's, it's this thing around definitions, which I think some people have mentioned. So I mean, the, some of the work that Bertrand uh, de la Chapelle has done with the Internet Jurisdiction Project has been quite helpful in drafting some kind of guiding kind of concepts and everything else. I mean, you may not agree with all of them, but it's, it's you know, giving some kind of boundaries around that. Because if we're the registrar of record, but not the hosting provider, we can only turn a domain off. We have no way of turning off you know, a subdomain or a page or anything like that. I have a completely binary decision. And it's, it's the same for, for Becky or, or Brian as registry operators. So I think some, some of this kind of conversation needs to evolve to a point where, you know, that you don't have a situation where somebody takes down an entire domain because of one bad subdomain or somebody, or we're forced to take down an entire, entire domain because of one page. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, Roberto Gaetano for the record. I'm speaking entirely in my own uh, capacity and uh, taking full responsibility for what I'm saying. Um, so take me down if you want. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, uh, um, I was thinking while this discussion was uh, going on, I was thinking that what uh, uh, Larry, uh, that happens to be here at my left, uh, uh, said uh, in, a, in a previous session about the process that brought uh, um, then, uh, um, a, that, that was very really successful, um, that uh, migrated the authority uh, of the um, U.S. administration away. <clears throat> it, that had an, a big implication. There was a community effort, and there were lots of people that had different opinions. And then at one point in time, some consensus was reached, uh, and, uh, and we could progress because there was the willingness by all the parties uh, to, to come to a, to a conclusion. So um, we are all aware that there are uh, strongly, deeply different opinions in different parts of the ICANN community and the outside world, uh, because we shouldn't forget that outside the ICANN community there are other people that are affected by the decisions, about uh, uh, content, uh, about uh, um, the way um, uh, you know, uh, things should uh, proceed uh, about whether, whether there's going to be takedown in what circumstances and so on. We are also aware, all of us, uh, that there is, at this point in time, is under the eyes of everybody, that there is increasing pressure um, um, with the excuse uh, uh, of terrorism, with uh, the excuse of uh, whatever, for passing something uh, um, for putting pressure to the, in the, to the operators, uh, um, for passing some idea that then, uh, as a matter of fact, has nothing to do with terrorism, has nothing to do with botnet, and, but uh, uh, to use this uh, as, as a uh, Trojan horse uh, for uh, achieving different uh, result. W what I see is that Parts of the operator, uh, for instance, donuts, uh, 
just not to make names, have taken a, a certain position. I think that the position that they have taken is, is extreme, is, is uh, um, with my head of uh, uh, chair of the Board of Public Interest Registry, something that I would not like my board uh, to make as a decision. But nevertheless, I have to recognize that there is this sort of pressure. And uh, uh, if we leave uh, the um, operators uh, in this business uh, alone, uh, then uh, they might take decisions uh, that the end user community would not like. So I, um, um, I'm looking forward, I, I, I also don't want, I fully agree, uh, and I don't think anybody in this room uh, wants to have ICANN uh, regulating this, taking the, the, the regulator hat and, and, uh, and forcing a behavior. But I think that those issues have to be discussed. Have, and uh, if the, we can come, if the community can come to an agreement uh, about some um, guidelines, uh, um, abandoning a little bit uh, the, 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 the religious approach uh, uh, that, that will bring us a, on a confrontation about all or nothing. Um, I think that uh, if we have some guidelines from the community that are sort of consensus of quasi-consensus, we will do um, um, a good step forward uh, in finding a, a, a solution that, if not perfect for anybody, is at least uh, good enough um, 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 for most of the people. So it, it's, um, um, I think that I would like to, to take this uh, uh, debate uh, a bit away from the philosophical principles uh, and say, what can we do in practice? I mean, what are what, uh, taking into account that there are different legislations, uh, the, uh, that there are uh, different cultures, uh, that there are uh, different problems. So um, I would like to see, not in this session, but in the future when this discussion is evolving, to go into some uh, um, practical indication and take a direction so that uh, towards uh, um, reaching a sort of uh, common understanding in first place and then possibly a solution. Thank you. Uh, so, do you want me to ask that? I, I can ask him. Okay. Uh, Roberto, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, could, could you please clarify again, you were talking about which solution, about due process or takedowns? Uh, well, um, let, let, me, let me phrase it better. Uh, uh, I think that it, it's obvious uh, that um, Michele has the right to take down whatever he wants. That's fine. Um, however, uh, I think that uh, there are, since there are these sort of pressures uh, and operators uh, tend to take different solutions, uh, that they have the complete freedom to take, uh, this brings some sort of lack of uniformity in, in, in the system, which is a good thing, but can also be a bad thing. I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, is something that I, I don't see the, the debate going into, into some practical things. You see what I mean? Is, um, I, I'm I, not I, I asking totally... this question to anybody uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I totally see what you mean. It's just, it's just, I think this is the best illustration when I say that some of the community members, the, the, the rat driving forces of coming forward with some community solutions on what to take down and how to take down and what be due process and so on. And for me, this is engagement and content regulation. If I can, would be the platform for this. So, uh, Robert, whatever you're doing, don't do that, I can. No, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do it in front of me. <laughs> but how about uh, we ask I can to uh, bind the registrars to be neutral and not take down content? <laughs> uh, all, I think you're, you're doing a very good job of trolling me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 
I, I, I'm not sure that's within ICANN's mission. To, tr to troll me? No, I suppose not. Um, no, I mean, joking aside, I mean, the... I think you're all right. I mean, the, I think we actually agree. We don't want, as a registrar, I don't want ICANN to tell me what I can or cannot take down, what I should or should not take down, because that is, opens up a massive can of worms. And it's just not, there's, going, there's no, there's going, it's a, you know, it's a slippery slope. It's, it's not something that will end well. I mean, I personally, I, when I read Spec 11 and the registry contract, when it was being pushed, pushed forward, I read some of the language in there and I died a little inside because it was so vague and so broad that I thought, oh my God, this is going to cause problems. And then if you look at the registrar accreditation agreement, there's an abuse reporting um, clause which comes into, two, it comes into two parts. One part is specific to um, consumer protection and law enforcement. Fine. That makes perfect sense. In the past 10 years, I think I've received two notices from them, and um, maybe a half dozen if I include our, our local cert who still haven't worked out that IP addresses can be shared, but we won't get into that. Um, but the other side of it, which is the abuse, the, the, the way it's worded, and the expectation led to a situation where several of us spent a disordinate amount of time trying to mediate with the intellectual property people who assumed that if they reported something, we were going to do something. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that it's the unintended consequences. I mean, the, the fact that somebody has the ability to report bad whatever, fine, I've no issue with that. But the expectation that, that the registrars or registries would take action opens up a massive can of worms. I mean, the, one of the expressions we use in English is, you know, that one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, or maybe it's the other way around. And it's the same thing when it comes to all forms of speech and content. If we can agree that it's within ICANN's mission to deal with DNS stability, somebody who is using a domain name or a platform to, to, to send out huge quantities of spam, running botnets, command and control, DDoS, all of that. If you're protecting that, there's, there's no point having a conversation. But everything kind of beyond that, we need to have the ability to follow our processes, engage on that. But I don't want a situation where ICANN is telling me I must protect Cartier, for example. I ask one more question to try to bridge these two points. For example, Roberto suggested that not ICANN org, but ICANN community comes together and tell each other what to do. How do you consider this situation? Or am I wrong? I, I think that uh, there is a big difference between regulation and providing guidelines that voluntarily uh, uh, the different operators can, uh, um, can adopt or not. And this is something uh, that was, a, for instance, a, a big discussion in the, um, in the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, you know, there was also this issue about regulation, and, and, and I hear um, the same pattern going on. It, there, is, there is something that is in between, uh, between free for all, and, uh, and every, everybody does every, what they want without, uh, without any kind of reference uh, to a discussion that has been uh, carried on. And the regulation, that means that uh, we decide a certain rule, I can impose this on everybody, and that's it. Uh, I'm, I feel the lack of uh, a discussion on specific case, on, on what, are, what are the situations in which uh, it will be better to do one thing and it will be better to do a different thing. We are, you know, there are some border case uh, uh, lines. Uh, and and I'm, I, I don't have, um, uh, really, I, I don't, there's no specif specific goal that I'm trying to reach with, uh, with my intervention. I'm just asking the question. I mean, shouldn't, uh, uh, shouldn't we, uh, we discuss more in practical terms uh, on what are the example of cases in which uh, for, it, it is in the public interest that certain actions are taken, and uh, other cases in which it is not in the public interest. 
Okay, thank you very much. So if, are there any other comments on this? Um, it can be a, like a two-way conversation, Michaela. I mean, but I don't see <laughs> I don't see any other comments on this issue, so we can just wrap up the session, or I can allow you to make your last comment. <laughs> uh, thanks. No, I just think you know Roberto's what Roberto's saying makes a lot of sense. The the concern I think that we've had in these discussions in the past within registrars and registries is if we try to formulate guidelines or best practices, it suddenly becomes, oh, these guidelines and best practices are out there, you all have to follow them. So it's, it becomes this kind of quasi-regulation, and I don't honestly know how to thread that properly. Now, but speaking to, I think, is it Jeremy um, or Malcolm? I'm not sure behind, I, can't, I haven't got eyes in the back of my head. Um, like we, you know, as service providers, we should be consistent and clear about what we do in, in situations that we know how to deal with. So been putting something in there, some level of transparency about how we will handle certain types of abuse and all that makes perfect sense. Because ultimately as a business, if, I'm, if I am acting inconsistently and pulling down zucchinis and instead of tomatoes or whatever that analogy was, eventually I'm going to lose, my, lose business. So that doesn't make any sense from my, from my perspective. And overall, in terms of the customer experience, it's just bad. But I think the problem is you don't want a situation where ICANN's mandating it. Thank you. Do you have any comment? No. Okay, well, okay, we can wrap up the session. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, we are from the non-commercial users constituency. And uh, one of our tasks is to prevent ICANN to become a content regulator. If you are a non-commercial user, uh, then you can take some of our brochures and join the constituency and fight for freedom of speech and human rights and privacy in domain names. <laughs>